But like as a younger entrepreneur, you feel like you you don't like you're not worthy or something, or like you it's like the imposter syndrome is like like a big thing, right? And so how did you overcome that that thing, right? Because obviously like you have overcome it and you've surpassed most people in the world right now, right? But so how did you overcome that in the beginning? So I'm glad that appears obvious because it's certainly it's certainly not true, right? Like I, I still feel imposter syndrome every day. You know, I still feel guilty on days where like I'm not working as hard as I could be. And I, in in the early days, the only thing we knew was how to work hard. So like obviously we didn't have the credentials, we didn't have a, a track record, we didn't have uh, sales data, you know. So I, it was just hard work. It was showing up. It was exhausting. It was discouraging. Um, there was a lot of times where I was like, why the hell are we doing this? You know, mm-hmm. like we're, we're never going to get there. And I think it's intimidating to, to really look at the top of the mountain or, or look at where, where competitors like Starbucks and Dunkin' are and say, yeah. geez, we're never going to get there. But what we can do every single day is just take one step at a time. And, and that's what my brother say is like, how do you move a mountain one stone at a time? So mm. for us, it, it's just this compounding effort. If you, if you bring that effort to work every single day, six years later, it's going to, it's going to, you're going to build something pretty awesome. Uh, and then you get confidence along the way. So I'm certainly more confident today than I was, but now I'm like, dang, we got 110 employees. We're valued at nearly half a billion dollars. Like, why am I the one that's running this? You know, like how, how yeah, could I sure. possibly be the person ready to do this? And we, uh, we have, we've surrounded ourselves with great advisors and great coaches. And uh, I think one thing we learned from our executive coach is that that's not unique to us. Everybody at any level of leadership, all of, all of the CEOs that, that our coach coaches feel some level of imposter syndrome. And the other thing that's interesting is they all feel guilty when they're taking time off, you mm-hmm. know, and, and I think that's a fascinating like psychology because it just means that people are putting pressure on themselves to, to be great, you know, and, and I certainly feel that too. So it's something that I'm working on. You know, I want to be happier in the moment, enjoy this journey rather than like grinding myself. In terms of like the lessons, right? Because obviously like you just um, spoke about a few lessons, but you know, to go from the three brothers, you know, that are pouring samples, like in a whole foods, just hustling. And then, you know, trying to work at night to get all the bottling thing from the factory to 110 staff at $55 million in sales, right? That's got to be hard, right? So how did you try, like, how did you just kind of handle that scale, that recruitment? I mean, you know, so we have like hundred and something staff as well, but we got there slower than you got there, right? You know, so you're there quick, right? And so how did you manage that speed of recruitment, ensuring there's a good culture, ensuring you got good people, you know, because because at that size, it's all about the people, right? And so, like, how did you figure that out? Like, and what have you learned in terms of that yeah. side of things? Yeah. So it, it, again, it's not a perfect process. Everything is iterative, and and you want to get hiring right because it's much more expensive to hire somebody and fire them and, than it is to to spend the right time hiring hiring the right people. What we learned is that shit breaks. You know, at twenty people the systems break at mm. 50 people, the systems break at hundred mm. people, the system breaks. So like we've, we've learned that throughout the way. And like, we weren't ready for, for the hundred people when we went from 50 to hundred, you know, like we had to build those systems. We say all the time, we're building the ship as it's flying. And I, I, I think you, you, you learn from, from mistakes pretty quickly, you know, like we can start to get intuitive. We, we, we tap some of our investors and, and, uh, our, like our advisors and say like, Hey, what should we expect? You know? And, and I think now the business is at a point where we can really attract top talent. Uh, my brother, Jordan, our youngest brother, he's, he's super passionate about hiring people who are smarter than we are, you know? Mm-hmm. So we're, we're surrounding ourselves with those folks and everybody brings uh, some, some new knowledge, some new systems, some new processes to the business. And that's, what's so great about building a company is it's, it's a reflection of the diverse people that you have within it. And I think for my brothers and I, our, our number one goal right now is, surrounding ourselves with the right people, but also maintaining the culture and, and the values and not just in a way that's like Wallwood, right? Like integrity, <laughs> respect, you know, stuff like that. It's like what leading by example and, and really articulating and showing what this energy is rather than telling uh, is, is super helpful in recruiting the right folks to join this mission with us. Yeah, sure. I mean, and you would have had to learn so much over the last... <laughs> five years, like just to scale that quick, just would have been um, intense. Right. And so what would you say was the biggest thing that you learned? You know, so what was the biggest 
piece of advice which you could pass on to somebody else who's listening right now that's kind of in their first year, they're grinding, it's tough, there's nothing working yet. It's kind of like um, you're still kind of having the noodles and the bread. You know what I mean? Like, like what would you say to them? I would say first you are qualified to do this, right? There's nothing special about me and my brothers. We were, we were decent students at a, a lower middle class high school, you know, like we're, we're, we're normal, very normal people. Uh, so I, I think get that out of your head that like entrepreneurs are uniquely qualified to, to do something that others can't. I think it's about how long can you stay in there? You know, how gritty are you to, to do it? And then the second thing that, that is, stays true from day one through now, even harder now is people management. It requires a lot of work, a lot of intentional effort. You know, and it's not not in a bad way. I think if somebody's not acting in accordance with your values or where you want them to act or how you want them to act, that just requires conversation and development and and work together. So I think one thing that that we we established early on is this commitment to trust or this commitment to transparency. And it's a culture where everybody provides feedback and accepts it. You know, and mm. and that's an uncomfortable thing to overcome, right? The easy thing to do is to say nothing or to talk shit behind somebody's back, which yeah. happens at a lot of companies. Mm-hmm. But for me to say, Alex, man, like I, I saw the way you showed up in that meeting and, and you were distracted, you were on your phone, like next time I'd love you to, for you to be there. One, that's uncomfortable for me to say that to you. And two, you're like, oh, damn it, Jim's, Jim caught me. Like, I feel bad now. Mm. You know, so like there's definitely an awkwardness that, that comes to that, but we've created a culture that where that's acceptable. And, and it's when you, when you understand that the person providing the feedback is coming from a good place, you sort of accept it as a gift rather than as like a, you don't get defensive, you know, like mm. I think it's, it's natural instinct to defend yourself and say, well, I was on my phone because I had an emergency, like, fuck you, Jim. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And look, I think um, it's those kind of, kind of harder, honest conversations that can really help a culture become stronger. It's like a relationship, right? But it's like a relationship with a much bigger family, right? Um, I prefer not family, but the word like team, right? You know, that everyone's like a team, um, but still you got to be honest, like, and to c- communicate. So I think that's a fantastic uh, piece of advice. And but just on that point as well, people management is the hardest thing in the world because they're people, right? And they're all different. And there's no, like, you, it's not like that's the way that it happens, right? Like it's not like Facebook ads, right? Like, you're like, okay, cool. So here's a strategy one, strategy two. There's like, it's complicated, right? And as you scale up, you need to learn, the people side of things. And so I think that's a fantastic point. Um, what's next for Super Coffee? Because obviously like there's going to be competitors trying to eat your lunch, right? Like, you know, like um, you guys are doing well right now, but you've got some pretty big competitors that you, you probably want to sell to, but they're going to try to beat you first, right? So how are you preparing to kind of have that battle, you know? Yeah. It, it, and it, it, so what's next right now, we're, we're raising raising more capital. We're raising our Series C, uh, bringing on another $50 million this summer. It's going well so far, but that's going to fuel growth. And and the disadvantage we have right now is we're still laying the distribution foundation, right? Like we're not even in half of the accounts that Starbucks is available in or Dunkin' Donuts is available mm-hmm. in. So we're trying to level the playing field by chipping away at just generally where we're available. And what's difficult is all of our resources are dedicated to getting product on shelf and supporting the product where it's currently distributed versus Starbucks and Dunkin, who all of their resources are focused on the accounts that they've been in for a decade or decades, right? And, and their, their efforts are now on repeat purchases and retention and new mm-hmm. flavors and, and discounts and things like that. So uh, we're starting at a bit of a disadvantage there. I think building out the distribution, uh, continuing to win at the account level, the good old fashioned way. There's no substitute for a human being going into a store and building a display or pouring samples and educating customers. So that's mm-hmm. where most of the proceeds of this next round are going to go. Uh, and then international white space, like you said, we're not available in Australia yet. We're only available in the continental U S actually, we might have a couple of stores in Australia, which is pretty cool. Or sorry, not Australia, Alaska. Oh, yeah. I was like, where's <laughs> no. the, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. <laughs> no, you got, me, you got me thinking down under, yeah. Yeah. uh, Alaska, um, but nothing in Australia yet. And uh, so I think international expansion is exciting because it's right now it's all white space. You know, China drinks five times more bottled coffee than the U S Japan is a big ready to drink coffee country. So uh, a lot of opportunity there. And and that's really um, where we'll go after we establish this beachhead further in the U S. And so will you IPO? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's certainly an option. I think, 
like we've built a really strong sales and marketing brand. Mm. We haven't built a, a, a foundational business in the sense that like we don't own our own factories. We don't have our own distribution networks. And those two things are really expensive. Those, those two pieces right there really take a chunk out of our gross margin. Mm. Um, so a, a lot of brands like us, like, like you said about vitamin water are built to sell to a strategic who has those synergies. Vitamin water is now produced by Coca-Cola in factories for a couple pennies, you know, mm. and it's distributed, it's distributed on Coca-Cola trucks. So the margin on that thing is damn near 70%. <laughs> yeah. Whereas for us, like we're, we're like in the, in the thirties. Yeah. Um, so to go public, like we don't get a factory and we don't get trucks. Uh, but there are some, some interesting case studies of some public companies right now, similar in size to us that, that are doing really well. Like Celsius energy drink is a, is a good one that, that I've referenced quite a bit. Yeah. Right. And kind of how much is the way that it was, uh, the way that it's going to be, you know, cause that old way of like, you got to have the factory and all that type of jazz. That's not how Airbnb did it right now. That's not what I'm saying about you guys because it's different because there is product, right? But, you know, like right. how much of the old way like, is affecting your decision for the future? Yeah. And the, so it's, it's funny is the old way has made it harder for us, you know, because honestly, like when Coke spent $4 billion for vitamin water, that was a bad investment. They never made that money back. So now CEOs of strategics like Anheuser-Busch and Nestle and Coca-Cola, they're under a lot more scrutiny and none of them want to be wrong. None of them want to overpay for a brand like us. So it's harder for us to get an outsized valuation like that in the private markets um, versus what's happening in the public markets right now with SPACs and, and retail trading, things like Robinhood. 